We're now um, four weeks, actually, from Easter in a season which the church has traditionally called Lent. That word Lent comes from the Old English, Lengthen, and the season actually has to do with the lengthening of days. And so you'll know as the days get longer and the days get brighter and spring comes and the days lengthen. And so in this season before Easter, the springtime, this is the time the church has used in preparation for Easter. And it's a time that the church has traditionally used to reflect on the cross, the event of the cross and the resurrection and the exaltation of Jesus and take extra time to pray and in terms of um, some of the spiritual disciplines, perhaps fast, uh, give to the poor. These are some of the traditional um, disciplines that the church has taken on during the season. In these next four weeks, uh, I want to look at especially the cross of Jesus as it relates to the gospel, as it relates to the good news of Jesus that we've been looking at in the last nine weeks together. We've looked at what is this good news of Jesus. And now I want to shift a little bit as we move towards Easter. We want to continue to look at what is the gospel, but now especially, what is the cross? What is the role of the cross in this good news of Jesus? And today, I want to focus especially on the subject of atonement. Atonement. Now, that sounds kind of like a theological word, and it is. And, you know, scores and scores of books, volumes of books have been written on the atonement. And I'm not going to read them all to you today. Um, I tried to read them all this week, but I, I didn't quite succeed. But the word atonement, we're going to look at that today and think about what it means for our Christian lives and what it means especially as we move towards uh, this, this uh, event of the cross. The root of the English word atonement actually is found right in that word itself, atonement. So at one and meant. Actually, that's the root of it. That's how the, the, the word was derived. And it has to do with reconciliation. It has to do with bringing together something that was broken, bringing together into one something that has been made broken. So it has to do with reconciliation. It has to do with uh, reparation. It has to do with mending of relationship. Something broken that now is needing repair. Atonement. That's the basic meaning of atonement in English. And that's the focus of our topic today as we move towards Easter. And I want to do that by looking at this passage in John, the very beginning of John chapter 1, in which we have the first introduction of Jesus by John the Baptist. So John the Baptist here in the first chapter of John is introducing us, the audience, to who Jesus is. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so I want to ask us, I want to ask three questions of this text today. First, what does John the Baptist mean when he says, the Lamb of God, when he calls Jesus the Lamb of God? What does he mean? by this phrase, the Lamb of God. Second, I want to ask, how, how does this Lamb of God take away the sin of the world? How does he do that? How does this Lamb of God take away the sin of this world? And why is that important? Why is it significant for us? And thirdly, I want to um, talk practically and talk about what, is it, what difference does it make for us today? And how can we enter into this atonement? How can we enter into this atonement that is offered to us? So as you know, we've been talking about the good news of Jesus. And I know all of you have really captured the sense of what that is. Because a few weeks ago, we had a final exam. And you all did marvelously well. You all passed. And uh, I know that you understand now that the good news of Jesus is about the kingship of Jesus Jesus Christ is really about Jesus the Messiah, 
and Jesus the Messiah is Jesus the anointed one, and Jesus the anointed one is Jesus the king. That's the climax of the good news of uh, the New Testament. And that really is the climax of the whole story of the Bible. Jesus of Nazareth, person in history who lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago, is the fulfillment of all of the stories of the Old Testament and the entire story as one seamless story of the Old Testament. He is its fulfillment as the Messiah, as the King. King not just of the people of Israel, but Lord over this entire world. And therefore, Lord over our lives, Lord over this whole world, this whole cosmos, whether or not people acknowledge that or not. Now, all of that is not new to you, I know, because you've passed a test. But I want to ask another question before we look at atonement. And I want to ask, I want to talk about salvation. It's been asked, actually, of me uh, since that very first day. Well, what about salvation? What's the role of salvation in the good news? Well, I think of it like this. The good news is a proclamation of who Jesus is. It's really about him. It's about his identity in this unfolding drama story of God's. And so it's about Jesus and his identity. Salvation is what happens as we, in our minds and in our hearts, hear this good news and we start to think and we start to believe that is true. Not just true in a sense that's detached from us and that's distant from us, but this truth, I want to live under this truth that Jesus is indeed king. He is Lord of this universe. And salvation is what begins to happen to us as that realization, not just a mental realization, but a, a realization of the heart and of the will of our whole existence as that realization begins to dawn on us and we begin to live under that truth. But what is salvation? Is salvation for after we die? Is that what salvation is for? For life after death or life after this life? Or is it for this life? Is it salvation for this life and what it means to live in this world? Well, the answer, I think, is yes, it is both. I think we would do well to remember that salvation partly is about life after this life. I think our society and our culture, we really tend to focus on this life. And just because of our time in uh, place in history and um, our culture, we place so much emphasis on uh, living in this life. And we don't often think about what happens after we die, what happens at the end of our time. Now, of course, as we age, um, the signs of our life and the signs of our getting older are harder and harder for us to ignore. So as we age, our bodies decline, our physical bodies uh, grow weaker, and uh, we start to think about what happens after we die. So as you know, I, I play badminton, and um, well, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that actually I've been able to progress in my game because I'm not a professional athlete, so there's lots of things I can work on. To, I can master my technique, I can master my footwork, I can continue to grow, and I can get stronger in certain areas, and that'll improve my game overall. So even though I'm not a young person anymore, I'm turning, uh, well, I won't tell you exactly how old I'm turning, <laughs> but I'm growing older, uh, I realize that my game has continued to get more and more refined. But I've been reminded recently that that hits a certain ceiling. So I played my son, who is 16, a couple of weeks ago. And as a teenager, he asked me to play. This is late at night, like at 10.30 at night. And I was fighting a cold. You know, that, that week I was kind of battling a bit of a cold. But, you know, if a teen, your teenager approaches you and says they want to do something, you know, as a parent, 
How can you say no? Because they're often in their own worlds and doing their own things with their own friends. When they approach you to ask you to do something, oh yeah, of course, 10.30 at night, I'll play with you. And so we go to the club and we play for a few hours and it's past midnight. By the time I get we played hard, we played singles together. There's nobody there but us playing late at night. And then I come home, I'm tired, I try to go to sleep, but the adrenaline's running. My blood is still pumping. I can't sleep. It's 4 a.m., 5 a.m. I finally go to sleep, maybe around 6 or 7, but I have to get up the next day. It's Saturday, but I still have to do work. And I'm tired. And guess what happens? My, my cold has now turned into a fever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a full-blown infection that the next week I have to take antibiotics for, and it, the next 10 days I'm spending trying to recover. And so I'm reminded that life is frail, and there's this gradual decline. I hit this wall, this ceiling. You know, my son is getting stronger, he's getting faster, not so for me. And there'll be this kind of a crossing and if that hasn't happened already in terms of um, our physicality. Salvation is not just about this life, but it's also about what happens after we die. Life after this life. And I think sometimes we don't think about that enough, that there is something good and beautiful and wonderful after this life, that includes our bodies, it includes our resurrected bodies that God has promised after we are resurrected in the end times, that we enter into eternal life that we have that is not, is not marred by sin, is not held back by the constraints of brokenness and sin and disease and weakness, but that will be restored and made whole and beautiful for eternity. That's a wonderful, wonderful promise. It's a part of this message of salvation. And I think it, 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 we do well to remember that because our society often is fixated on the things of this life and the benefits of this life. And that resonates with me, this truth that life is more than just about this life. After my 70, 80, 100 years, if I'm lucky, that there's more to life than just this life. But Jesus promises that we in our bodies will be resurrected with him and be able to enjoy life with him for eternity. That is part of the salvation that, that Jesus offers us. But at the same time, it's not just about eternal life. It's not just about life after this life. And so I was listening to a radio message this past uh, week or a couple of weeks, and uh, the radio talk show host was talking about salvation as being purely about eternal life. And he's talking about evangelism as being just helping people to understand that there's something after this life. And he talked about how this life, he said, he quoted Jesus as saying that in this life you'll have tribulation, and that we shouldn't expect anything from God in terms of consolation in this life, in terms of healing in this life, in terms of goodness in this life, because in this life we'll have pain, we'll have suffering, we'll have disease, and so we focus everything on the next life. And that's what salvation is about. That's what evangelism is about. But to me, that seems like a very cynical understanding of the Christian life. Jesus did say, I've come to give life and to give it abundantly. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. In the past tense, salvation is not just about eternal life, but it's also about this life. There is a good deal, the good measure of salvation that we experience in this life, a good measure of healing that we experience, a measure of his presence and his comfort, and his peace. These all have to do with salvation and that we experience today. And I feel part of what the message of the salvation is, the gospel is, is that we enter into the salvation even today and we experience that all our lives and even after this life 
nothing can take that away from us because that's what God has secured for us through Jesus. And so, what about salvation? Well, salvation is part of the benefit of what we receive as we enter into the story of the good news. Salvation is not just about eternal life, although it is that. Salvation is also about this life, but it's not confined just to this life. So, back to atonement now, back to atonement, which I feel is an element of salvation. Atonement, this making oneness, this reconciliation is a part of the salvation message. It's part of our response to the good news of Jesus. It's not all that we experience. It's not the message itself. So partly we're kind of just trying to distinguish um, the good news message from our response to it and our, our, our experience of it. But atonement is partly what we experience in this salvation that we receive from Jesus. So I want to look at our text again uh, from John chapter 1. I'll read it out just parts of it and the focus the the parts that I really want to focus on today the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and verse 35 the next day again John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus and as he walked by and said behold the Lamb of God so first, what does John the Baptist mean when he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Look at the Lamb of God. What is this Lamb of God, or who is this Lamb of God that we hear John speaking about, that we even sang about today, that we heard preached on last week um, from Mike Woods? Well, for those of us who, who've been in church for a while, that phrase, the Lamb of God, kind of just rolls off our tongue. We don't even think... Um, twice about it, um, because we know that, that the Lamb refers to Jesus. But in the first century, and for the first disciples who heard this phrase, the Lamb of God, that would have been a very puzzling phrase, because it had not been used at all. This title had not been used at all of anyone, and especially of a Messiah, or a Messiah figure. The Lamb of God, this is the only time it occurs in the Gospels. It does occur in Revelation, but we think Revelation is written a long time after the time of the Gospels, or a long time after the time of Jesus, you know, the end of the first century. So if the disciples are hearing this phrase, or in the early church hearing this phrase, the Lamb of God, what would it have meant to them? It's kind of a puzzle, the Lamb of God. Would John the Baptist even have understood the title Lamb of God? I'm not sure that he would have. Because later on in the Gospels, what we hear is that actually, as Jesus is living his ministry and enacting his ministry, and he doesn't look like the kind of Messiah that everybody thought he would look like, John the Baptist sends some, some of his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one that we are looking for? Or should we look for someone else? Are you the Messiah, or, is, or should we look for someone else? He even doesn't quite understand what this phrase, Lamb of God, really um, refers to. But what we have to do to understand this phrase, this title, is look back in the Old Testament to understand what this Lamb of God refers to. So it means at least three things. And... I wrote part of my thesis on this, a whole chapter. So if you're interested, you can read it. And I won't bore you by reading it to you here because it's really quite technical. But it means at least three things. It's an allusion to at least three things in the Old Testament, three traditions in the Old Testament that I want to um, summarize for you. The first is, has to do with the Exodus and the institution of the Passover lamb. And so you know the story, all of you know the story from Exodus, that 
the people of Israel become slaves in Egypt for several generations, and they cry out to God, and God delivers them. And part of that deliverance is that he sends plagues upon Israel, I'm not Israel, upon Egypt in order to free Israel. And the last plague is a plague of death. He sends an angel of death to Egypt to, to kill the firstborn son of every uh, Egyptian family because of their rebellion. And he gives a command to the Israelites. They are to kill a lamb, a uh, one-year-old lamb, not older than a year old, and take the blood and smear it on the doorposts of their households in which they live. And as the angel of death passed by, that angel would recognize this blood and recognize that the household belonged to the people of God, and therefore he would pass over this household, and that household would be saved. And that lamb was slaughtered, it was to be eaten, it was a sacrifice, it was to be eaten, that blood would be smeared, and then they would prepare themselves to, to exodus, to make exodus, uh, to exit from Egypt that night. And of course, that ritual dinner, supper, is then uh, continued to be instituted every year as a Passover supper to commemorate, to remember their exodus from Egypt, and to, they're to remember that by eating the Passover lamb. Now, that Passover lamb is not specifically tied to forgiveness of sins and not tied to sin, but what happens over time is that this Passover meal is to be celebrated in one place, not just in their homes, but at the temple in Jerusalem. So it's commanded by some of the kings later on that this Passover meal is to be celebrated in Jerusalem and people are to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem and bring a lamb and that lamb is to be slaughtered and they're to eat that lamb there in the temple, there in Jerusalem, and the priest would take some of that, and then the family that brought it would take some of that, and they would offer that sacrifice. And what happens is that what happens in Jerusalem at the temple are sacrifices. Sacrifices often for the forgiveness of sin. And so the fact that this Passover lamb was also offered at Jerusalem in the temple would have associated this Passover lamb with sacrifice with the offering and with forgiveness and so there's that association in the minds of the disciples so that's why passover lamb becomes associated with forgiveness of sin so that's a first illusion that this phrase the lamb of god taking away the sin of the world uh, makes in the old testament the second one the second one has to do with Isaiah chapter 53 and the servant of Yahweh. And we're going to read some of that to us. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. He was oppressed, verse 7, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. What or who is this lamb? Well, it's referring back to Isaiah chapter 53, and this servant of Yahweh, this servant of the Lord, being referred to, as a lamb, as a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. Now again, of course, as we read this text, as Christians, we think immediately of Jesus. But again, in the first century context, the Jews of that time, they would have read this text and didn't even refer to a Messiah for them. Why? It could not have referred to a Messiah because a Messiah cannot suffer and messiah cannot die and so no jew in that time would have thought that this text in isaiah 53 referred to a messiah to come but what we have to understand is that this text in isaiah actually comes in a large section which 
scholars call Second Isaiah from chapter 40 all the way to chapter 55. And what's going on in that section in Isaiah is that Israel is in exile. They're in slavery again. And this time, they're in Babylon. This time, it's Assyria and Babylon who have taken them captive. And now they're looking for deliverance again. And this part of the section of Isaiah, they're in captivity. And part of the prophecies to Isaiah is that there is going to be this servant, this servant of Yahweh, this servant of the Lord, who will help to deliver them, who will be a light to the nations. And at first, this servant actually it seems like it's a remnant of Israel. It's a part of Israel itself. But then as we read these chapters of Isaiah, what happens is that this servant actually fails. Israel fails. And so there's this shift. And then this very last servant of Isaiah passage in uh, servant of Yahweh passage in Isaiah talks about this other servant, the servant who suffers and who dies and then who takes on the transgression of his people, transgression and the sins of his people and suffers and dies. So again, the first century in Jewish people, they would have read this text and they would have thought, we don't understand this. It's it just doesn't make sense to us. And so this text was uh, uh, laid in obscurity until the first century church and Jesus began to apply it. They would have read this text after Jesus, and perhaps Jesus himself would have explained it to them, unpacked it to them, and they said, yes, now we understand. The Messiah is prophesied to suffer and to die for the people. It's not a conventional kind of a Messiah conventional kind of a king, but it's one who will suffer and die for the people. And so this understanding, this text, then Isaiah 53, is associated with this Lamb of God by that phrase, the Lamb who suffers. So that's a second illusion. The third illusion has to do, as I mentioned already, with the possibility of just sacrifice. Sacrifice. So one of the things that God provided for Israel in um, their relationship with him in the Old Testament was this provision for sin, this atonement. And now I'm talking about atonement in a different sense, not just a reconciliation, but in the Old Testament, in the Bible, atonement has this very specific technical sense. It has to do with cleansing of sin through sacrifice. That's what that word atonement in Hebrew and then translated into the Greek means. It's a technical worship term that has to do with the cleansing of sin because of the offering of sacrifice at the altar, the slaughtering of an animal, the shedding of its blood, and then the sprinkling of that blood on those who had come to offer that sacrifice, the proclamation of the priest making that sacrifice, and then the cleansing of sin, the renewal of, of the people's re, uh, the relationship with God. So atonement in that wider sense, yes, but atonement also in this very specific worship setting sent, sense in which there's this forgiveness of sins because of the shedding of blood, because of the sacrifice of an animal. So when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, he would have he would have referred at least to these three things. The Old Testament Exodus story of the Passover sacrifice, and second, the Isaiah um, suffering servant of the Lord, and third, the sacrifice that was being made daily at the altar in Jerusalem, at the temple, the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. So who is this Lamb of God? Well, whoever it is, it has to do with suffering. It has to do with this forgiveness of sin, the removal of sin, the cleansing of sin, this atonement that is happening in the Old Testament. And it has to do with the, the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin. And all of that, of course, is foreshadowing what happens at the end of Jesus' life. 
on Good Friday, the shedding of his blood as a sacrifice for our sin to atone, to make one, to reconcile us to God. That's part of what this gospel message is about. And why did Jesus have to die? What does this death mean in this gospel story? Well, the New Testament tells us that not only was he king, but that he died is significant because it makes atonement. It makes reconciliation possible. It makes forgiveness of sins possible. And that is the way that we enter into salvation. That's part of our benefit that we receive as those who experience salvation is this forgiveness of sin. I want to touch briefly on this other question. Well, how? How does this make atonement? And as I, as I mentioned, how does Jesus take away the sin of the world? As I mentioned at the beginning of uh, this message, you know, theologians have wrestled over this uh, question for millennia, literally. Um, ever since, you know, the, the opening pages of the New Testament, people have thought, how? How does this make atonement? And I'm not going to answer the question because uh, definitively for us today because I don't know if there is a single answer. What we do know is that Jesus does make atonement, is that somehow forgiveness of sin and reconciliation is possible. How that works exactly, I don't know. And I don't think anyone can truly know. So I'm just going to uh, read out to you a few of the the, what are called atonement theories, and I won't even explain them to you because um, they're just really complex, and this is not the space and time to do it. But there is a Christus Victor theory, there's a ransom theory, there's a satisfaction theory, the moral influence theory, the government theory. There is probably what is more commonly known to us Protestants is the substitutionary atonement theory, and that is that God places on Jesus a penalty for our sin, that God's wrath and God's sense of justice is met by placing what was our punishment, what was the consequences for our punishment onto Jesus in his sacrifice of his sinless life. So that's substitutionary atonement, that he takes our place on the cross. He takes what is rightfully our consequence onto his life, and therefore that makes atonement. And that also satisfies God's sense of justice and holiness. But all of these theories have elements of truth, and all of them also have challenges in terms of if we just pick one of them, there are challenges to thinking, well, is this really all that atonement is? And it sometimes will place God in a box in terms of, well, is God just a God of wrath, for instance, that he needs to atone for sin through, um, through the sacrifice of his own son? So there are challenges to each of these theories of atonement. And to be honest, I'm not a systematic theologian, and I think all of these have different elements of truth within them. I think the, the theologian, T.F. Torrance, who is a systematic theologian, one of the preeminent systematic theologians of the 21st century, he's passed on now, but he wrote a book on the atonement, 575 pages worth of it, and afterwards he writes this, the meaning of the cross of Jesus Christ is one that we cannot penetrate by human reason or by any theories of atonement as such. There is no logical relation between the death of Jesus at Calvary and the forgiveness of our sins. The infinite and holy mystery of the cross is one in which, in the passion and death of Christ on the cross, God has intervened decisively on our behalf to establish our lives on an entirely new basis. In other words, it happens. Atonement. Reconciliation happens. Forgiveness happens. How it happens? Even T.F. Torrance doesn't quite know, 
And he takes 575 pages to kind of explain what he thinks the Bible is trying to spell out. Yet in the end, it's kind of a mystery how we are able to be reconciled to God, how we as human beings, sinners, broken people are able to be reconciled with God, the Holy One, through Jesus' death. A bit of a mystery, but it happens. Let me share with you one of my experiences of atonement. Um, when I was a young pastor, I remember making confession to a brother, a Christian brother, some of the most shameful things that I'd done in my life, I'd never shared with any other human being. And I'd grown up in the church, I'd grown up as a Christian, but just had never had a chance to share some of these things with, with anyone else. And I remember sharing this with this Christian brother. I was already a pastor at that time. And as, after I shared, I was bracing myself for some words of um, rebuke, some words of correction, some words of admonishment, that I should have known better, that I shouldn't have done these kinds of things. Some kind of judgment. Instead, what I received was not judgment, but forgiveness. What I received was a message that my sin, my brokenness, was placed on the cross with Jesus. And that Jesus is cleansing, Jesus is life, Jesus' purity was transferred to me. And I knew these things in my head, but hearing them prayed out loud to me in that time of confession changed something in my mind, changed something in my heart. That my sin was taken on the cross, and Jesus took my sin, and instead of the judgment and condemnation that I deserved, I was offered life. And I had smeared on my head oil, oil of anointing, a sign of cleansing, a sign of the Holy Spirit. Sprinkled on me was water, again a sign of cleansing, a sign of new birth, and this prayer that Jesus forgives me because of what he had done. And I remember um, walking out of that office, and I felt lighter, physically lighter, as if my body just was kind of floating. I was just walking on air. And I remember walking down the street, the same street I'd walked um, many, many times before. The grass was greener. The, the flowers were prettier. They were just more beautiful. Why? Something had changed within me. Some kind of atonement had happened, some kind of restoration of relationship between myself and my creator had happened. It was real. I don't know exactly how or why, you know, that, that works, but it did. That was my experience, one of the experiences I have of atonement. I want to enter into this third question now. What difference does it make? And I want to especially ask, how do we enter in? How do we enter into this atonement, this uh, relationship that God offers to us and invites us into? Well, if you'd asked me what difference it made as I stepped out of uh, that office that day, it makes all the difference in the world. I mean, I really, I literally saw things different with new eyes, with fresh vision. I felt different makes all the difference in the world that we can live in a way that is free. Paul said it was, was for freedom that Christ has set us free, free from the yoke of slavery, free from sin. In this passage that we talked about today, John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Notice that it is not sins, individual sins that he takes away. It is that, of course, but notice it's sin singular. I think that's intentional because it's not just individual sins that he takes away, but it's the power of sin that is broken over the world. The power of sin which manifests itself in sins in our lives, brokenness in our lives. But it's the power of sin that is broken through Jesus' death and resurrection and exaltation to heaven on the cross. 
And so that, that sin no longer has power over us. Freedom, instead, is our destiny. But what can we do? How do we enter in, especially during this season of Lent? I think one of the practices that we can practice, one of the things that we can do, is confession. In terms of atonement, that is how we receive the benefits of this forgiveness. Confession. We own up. We own up to those things in our lives which we're not proud of, those things in our lives which we know our own conscience tells us we don't even have to look to Scripture. We don't have to look to ethical rules and boundaries, things which our own hearts tell us, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have behaved like that. I shouldn't have thought like that. I shouldn't have... You fill in the blanks. Confession. It's swallowing our pride. It's kind of a, a dying itself, isn't it? It's a little bit of a sacrifice of our own lives, a dying of our own pride. Confession. Bringing ourselves to the Lord. That's how we enter in into this concept, this... Um, notion of atonement and forgiveness. Confession to the Lord, but also confession to each other. Uh, it was Bonhoeffer who said that in my own words, forgiveness is weak, but in the words of a brother or a sister, those words of forgiveness become strong. That when we forgive ourselves or we just receive God's forgiveness for ourselves, just by ourselves, um, there, is, there is value to that, and there is value in just confessing to the Lord, I think, in our own space and private um, devotional time and quietness to the Lord. But there is tremendous value in confession to a brother or sister because when we feel insecure in our own words, a brother or sister's words to us, they mean something else. They can speak a message of strength, of forgiveness to us. They speak a reality to us that we may be insecure about. And so confess to a brother, to a sister. Encourage us to do that. So I want to take some time now just to pray and give us a time of reflection um, and confession in your heart. But I also want to encourage you, we're going to have some time of prayer um, during the worship if there's been something that's bothering you this past week and you have a chance to bring it to the Lord, um, I'd encourage you to, to bring it to one of our prayer uh, people, prayer ministry people, and they can pray for you. Everything is confidential, and they won't share that with anyone else unless you uh, want them to. Um, but I invite you to, to avail yourself of uh, the prayer ministry people that we will have uh, in worship um, once uh, the team comes up to begin worship. But let's pray. Let's pray now. Take some time. Um, offer, offer our hearts to the Lord. <laughs>